Now, this one, I had to tease out what N, P, and Q were and then throw them into the formula. This is much, much, much simpler. This is straight to the point. They tell you N, P. They tell me, what, what is this? <laughs> over here, what would X be? What would X be over here? Nine and or ten. X is the number of successes. So how would I set this up, the equation? How many things do I have total? Fourteen. And how many of them do I want to choose? Four. I want four of those fourteen to be successes. So how many point sixes do I want? Four. And how many point what? Point four. How many of those do I want? Ten. So I want four out of these fourteen to be successes. So I want four successes, ten failures. Try that out. Let's see if we all get the same answer. It actually stands for combinations, but I call it choose because that's really what it is. It's how many ways you can choose so much. So how many ways can you choose four from 14? Does that make sense? So if I had 14 students right here, how many ways could I choose four of you at a time? That actually becomes a really pretty big number because it could be the first four, the last four, the first one, the last three, the middle three, and the you know all us. Yeah. Well. All right, so to put this into the calculator, I'll go ahead and show you guys the shortcut too, which is never good enough, but it's a really nice way to check your work. All right, so to put this in the calculator, it'll be 14. How do you get to choose again? Uh, math. Math. Probability. Probability. Number three. So this middle one, this would be NPR, that would be uh, how many ways I could choose four people and I count, if I pick them in a different order, I count all those different orders. So that would always be a bigger number than the C one, holy shit. So we only need the three, the, the, the choose. 14 choose four times 0.6 to the fourth times 0.4 to the tenth. All right. So 0 0.0136. Okay, now here's what the old book has. And, and again, you know, this is, there used to be tables of logarithms. So they're gone, which is fine with me. But this, this, there's another reason to have this kind of thing, just because it's a nice, quick visual when it's not so bright. So we had N was 14, right? Yeah, Jeff. And then P is, <laughs> P is 0.6, P is 0.6, N is 14, and I wanted how many successes? I wanted four successes, right? Sure, man. <laughs> so, and what answer we got? We got 0 0.0136. So round into three places, 0 0.014, there it is. And notice this, if you look at this, look at these probabilities. As, they, as you go up here, what happens to them? They go, they increase, and then they decrease. And there's two in the middle that are the same. So it is perfectly symmetric. You guys kind of with me? In fact, what would your guess be, even with everything I talked about earlier? What's your best guess for what the mean is? Mm -hmm. Just looking at this. I, I would think it'd be right in the middle of these two. So I think it'd be about 8.5. And sure enough, what's 0.6 times 14? 8.4. 8.4, sweet. So it came up pretty close. All right, maybe, maybe, maybe. So if you have the old book, they will reference the table. That's the table we're talking about. If you have the new book, you guys don't get that experience. It's too bad. But, you know, and the, you know, the, the, you can create that table nowadays and Excel and all that kind of stuff. But some schools don't have the money to have a whole Excel lab like us. So we still need this. Okay. So enough of that. Oh, let me give you back here. Look, that would probably be nice. I'm going to keep this up here for later. I can do that. So, pop. Okay. All right. Anything else from homework before we get into new stuff? Okay. I'm kind of excited about today because we're actually going to. Uh, the last section in Chapter 5 is pretty quick. We've already talked about half of it, right? Without you guys even knowing it. Um, 
And then we get into the most important chapter in the book. So it's kind of, you know, a monumental day. Um, and you're like, yeah, this feels like the normal <laughs> thing to me, man. All right. So, let me give you this, this handout, actually. This is probably really good. Um, oh, one last one thing before we do this. I don't know if you guys remember, if, uh, so I was making fun of Shaquille O'Neal a while back to say he made 30% of his free throws, and he takes 20 shots. How many shots would you expect him to make? Seven, six, five. Uh, <laughs> Zero. You must like yeah, so, so it'd be n times p, 20 times 0.3. So I'd expect him to make six, and that kind of makes sense. If he makes 30% of his shots, he takes 20. My best guess would be 30% of 20. Now, some days he might be doing better. Some days he might be doing worse. That's why that would be the average. That's the average of how many he would make. So we've talked about that before. And in fact, I think I even put this formula down. I can't remember now. But that's the formula for the mean for binomial distribution. I don't know if you guys realize this. That is the best formula for the mean we've seen yet. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Kicks ass. You don't have to do x, p of x forever and you add them all up, right? Now you're right, it, keep, it keeps going, thankfully. It's even more good news. The variance is NPQ. So what's the standard deviation? Square root of NPQ, crazy. So what's the standard deviation for Shaquille O'Neal's free throw makes out of 20? Figure that out, take a minute, figure that out. Should be less than a minute, hopefully. What's Q again? If the P is 0.3, this is probably he makes the success, Q is the failure rate. Oh, okay. And what would that be? 70. Yeah, 30 percent, 70 percent. Of course, those two always have to make one when you add them up. So for his average, it's six. His standard deviation is 20 times 0.3 times 0.7. Two point zero four nine sounds about right. So let's see who's been doing the homework because I don't think I've really talked about this next thing a lot in class. What's the minimum expected value, and minimum usual value, and the maximum usual value? Mean minus, or mean plus or minus two. Good. Two three. steps away. Five percent of something, a five percent chance for something to happen would be unusual. So in a normal distribution, unusual would start outside of two standard deviations, because how much is inside of two standard deviations? 95. 95, so how much is outside? 5%. Five. Five that would be unusual to be up there. So what is mu minus 2 sigma and mu plus 2 sigma? 95%. No, no, no. Not, not the percentage, but what is it? So mean is 6, standard deviation is 2.049. So do that and that. Thank you. Thank you. So the minimum usual value, 4.098, so it'd be 1.902. I can't keep it up brain. 1.902. And the max, 10.498. So if you made 10 free throws, Personally, I'd be a bit shocked, but but it would be it wouldn't be unusual. It's within that range, right? If he made twelve, like whoa, dude, what the hell? Just that that'd be a little freaky. So I don't know if you guys remember, if I throw if I flip a coin five hundred times, how many heads do I expect? Two hundred fifty. Two hundred fifty. And we we're all we we're talking about well, if it was two fifty three, that's fine. So where does it start to get weird? Well, we could do this. All right, let's figure that out next. Any, any questions on this up here? This is exactly the homework, by the way. 
the homework's going to say, what's the mean? What's standard deviation? Tell me what's maximum. And then they might say, is 7 weird? Would 1.2 be weird? And you just see to see, does it fall inside not weird or is it outside? Okay. So if I flipped a coin, a fair coin, 250 times, what's the max and min uh, usual number of heads? So you guys are able to do that whole problem. So there's a lot inside that question. What do you have to calculate? The mean, standard deviation, and then you have to do the whole plus and minus thing. Cool. So what's P, what's Q? <coughs> yeah, so we're assuming it's fair. N is 250. 250. Cool. What's the mean? 125. Yeah, 125, half of 250. Standard deviation? 7.96. Some of you guys might realize something real quick. That you've already done, so you just got to do square root of that times Q. You know, a little quicker on calculations. Let's see, a lot of time, who cares? So what do you get for the standard deviation against R? 7.906. 7.906. So now we have a, 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 finally, we have a good definition for where it starts to technically, officially be known as unusual. So if I start at 250 and I go up two steps, where do I end up? Two of these? It's like 265? No? If I go up, from the mean? Or from oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. The mean was what? 125. So we go two steps up. 140.8. 140.8. Two steps down. 409.2. Well, how are we doing? All right, that's the mean minus two standard deviations, the mean plus two standard deviations. All right. Cool. So if I did flip a coin, 250 times, and I got 141 heads. I could officially be freaked out. <laughs> right? Like something might be wrong with this coin, or you know, something like that. It's evidence that something weird just happened. Now, of course, probability says that could happen. In fact, you could flip a coin 250 times and get 250 heads. It doesn't mean something weird happened, but the probabilities become higher that something weird happened. Either it's a, a coin that's off, uh, the, the, the weight's different, or you have some kind of weird telekinesis and you just wanted heads to show up so they happen more often? Something, right? Okay. So that's that section. That section's not very full of stuff. It's actually, that's it. That's, it. that's awesome. Yes, sir? So 109.2 is the minimum usual, right? Yes, the minimum usual and the max usual. Got it. Beautiful. Later in the course, when we get to chapter 8, um, if I wanted to test a hypothesis I had. If I wanted to show the fire company 
that the, there was a new fire station opened up, and I want my fire insurance to go down. So I have to prove this to the insurance company. They're going to tell me what's unusual or not, what time is going to be good enough. I can't say I'm going to use 5% and get this. No, they would say, no, we're going to use 1%. Yeah. yeah. So that would push you further out. You, you guys kind of with so that idea of where unusual starts is not set in stone. Right now we're saying it's 5% because that's actually what's used most often. If you look at Gallup, the gallup.com I've pulled up with you a couple times, at the very bottom page it always says within 95%. So that 5% outside is used most often. But it's not the only thing used. So here, you guys try the first couple problems on this sheet. So on this problem, on the first couple problems here, what, what's the N for this problem? 14? 14. What's the P? 0.5. And the Q? 0.5. Because right, those two have to add up to 1. So again, we're assuming it for a coin. Uh, exactly 9 heads, what would that formula look like? You have 14 choose 9. 0.5 to the 9th, 0.5 to the 5th. So as you might realize, when it's P and Q is the same as 0.5, it's always going to be 0.5 to the 14th at the end. So it's a little, you know, doesn't really save a lot of time. And when you plug this in the calculator, what do you guys get? Got that? What do you get? Point one two two. Point one two two. Okay. Point one two two two. It's all around there. Cool. Now number two. What? Is, what about number two? What do you do with that guy? We just did one a lot like that earlier, but it, this one is actually at least two heads would be. 
two or three or four or up to 14. So do I want to do that way or what's the opposite of that? One or none. So I'd much rather do that. So I can. I can just do one minus the opposite situation. That's what you always ask yourself. Is that probability got less or does its opposite have less work to do? Let me do the ones that got less work. Okay. So here it would be one minus the probability of zero or one. Of course, that or tells me I'm going to do what? Add. So if I figure out this part first, how do you do the probability of zero? How many am I flipping? 14. 14. And I want how many of them? Zero. zero. Good. So how many successes? 14. Zero. Zero. And how many failures? 14. 14. I know these are the same, but I'm going to still, in general, if they're not the same, you have to be careful. And I want to add to that. 14 shoes. One. So how, you want one success and 13 failures. Cool. So if you add those together, get that number, and then it can subtract that from one, that'll be the actual question. That'll be the opposite situation. So try to put that in the calculator. Calculator. good chance for me to make sure that you guys understand what your calculator is telling you. Um, let me, uh, if you guys can handle this. So I didn't change my powers on my 0.5 because it's going to come out to be 0.5 to the 14th anyway. Who cares? You kind of with me? So technically I don't have that set up right, but it's the right numbers because you screw it. I just want to do it real quick. So are you guys getting these numbers here? 6.1, blah, blah, blah. Now be real careful. I got people in the homework telling me the answer to the probability is like 9.7. So 970% chance something's going to happen. It's like so going to happen, you can't get away from it. Ah, yeah, it's going to happen, right? Uh, so obviously it can't be more than 100%, right? 110% is all psychological. It's not really going to happen. Uh, and then the same idea. So what does that mean? Yes, times 10 to the negative fifth. So I actually just got to move the decimal back five times. Which very quickly, I always got to move it once to get around one number, and then the rest will be zero, so there's always one less zero. Mm -hmm. So it'll be four zeros, and then six, one, blah, 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 and then three zeros and eight, five. And you can add those together. So what do you get when you add those together? second, do that one minus thing in a second. But these two together, if you add those last two things together, what do you get? You do them separately and then add them together? Yeah, so, uh, so to do this very quickly, you could say that plus 14 choose 0. <laughs> so what do you do? You just do the second. Yeah. You go to so, math. So you put the or some guys might realize math. Well, and I'll just leave it there. And there are some things you can realize that make that quicker. So but that that's what it is. So it's point oh 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 nine one blah blah blah. So one minus point oh 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 nine two roughly. So we'll we'll have it. Again, you guys are probably thinking, dude, it's not the 1920s, but I'm about to tell you, yeah, we have calculators. But 
If I do one minus the decimal, the quickest way is to make everything nine except the last one. So how do you make zero, nine? You add nine. So it's nine, 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 oh. zero. Right. Make the last one ten, eight. <laughs> okay. That's what one minus that is. Okay. Quick, right? Screw your calculator. Yay, it could do stuff. Yay. It has no life. I have a life and I could do that shit. So point. I don't know about the life. <laughs> yeah, I, I find that. Point nine 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 oh eight. So you're almost definitely going to get at least two aheads, which kind of makes sense because less than that would be unusual. Maybe we're going to find out here in a minute. Yes, ma'am. Never mind. Well, I mean, for the second half that we just did over here, we got it. We got <coughs> these numbers that. Yeah, that was this guy. If I remember correctly, and then this guy was something else, and you have to add them together. Okay. Yeah. And then that. And that's where the nine point, uh, the o o o nine two came from. Okay. That's me rounding it a little bit. All right. So moving on, and here I tell you something interesting. Now here's the shortcut. So let me show you the shortcut in the calculator real quick. So. What do you think the calculator needs to know? Does it need to know both P and Q? No, because it can calculate Q real easy if I tell it P. It knows how to make Q just make it one minus. So it only needs N, P, and X, the number of successes I want. So here's where I go. I go to second VARs to get into distributions, because we're talking about a binomial distribution. And the very first dude looks interesting. We'll come back to him. If you go down a little bit, you eventually get to those two. So now you got to figure out which one of those two do I want to use. So for the first problem, it says exactly 9. So I want a particular value. So which one do you think I want to use out of A and B for a particular value? A. A. B would be for a cumulative value. So if I want to go from 0 up to 7, I would use part B. It would give me all the values up to 7 added together. If I say exactly something, you want part A. You want the binomial PDF for particular. This is all on your calculator Bible, by the way, that handout I gave you 7.8 million years ago. So if we do part B, you know, got part A. <laughs> what was N again? It was uh, 14. And of course, a 50% chance was N, P. And now you finally see why you have punctuation in your calculator, right? Comma. So 14 comma, point for N, P, and then finally X. So for part A, it was exactly 9. There you go. How we doing? Okay. And then part B said at least 2. So that's going to use the combination. Yeah, the C. Now, binomial CDF is hardwired to do zero up to the number you put in. So if I would have done binomial CDF here, it would have added the probability zero up through the probability of nine. So if I want at least two, I have to apply that one minus thing. I have to do one minus. Now, now where would it go? If I want to start at two and go up, the opposite would be start at zero and go up to one. So I would say one minus, get back in here. Hit the up arrow to go from the bottom of the list, it's quicker. <coughs> Binomial CDF. And then I put in almost the same, the 14.5, but now I want to go up to 1. And that's what we got, right? Thank you guys. I never know anymore now. It's going to be the number I want up there or not. <laughs> I can't trust it anymore. The foundation's been shaken. How do you feel so far? I mean, that, that's just recreating what we just did by hand. So if you don't understand that, it almost doesn't matter to me, right? Because that's just a quick way to check your work. It's not good enough to say, well, I typed this in. And what I really love is if somebody says, well, I took stats and retaken it, and my teacher before let us do that. I don't give a shit. <laughs> they don't. They can let you, let the calculator think on its own as much as you, they want it to. You're not with them anymore, right? Okay. Um... So let's go back to the handout. <coughs> so real quick, what what the average? What's the mean for this expected value? 
seven. Yeah, it's got to be seven, right? It's going to be exactly half of 14, so it's seven. Figure out what the, vari the variance and the standard deviation is. Go ahead and do that. You've got the formula right there. I like that some of you guys are like, he's asking me to do something. <laughs> so do that. Figure out what the variance is. What are you guys getting for the variance? 3.5, good. And standard deviation? Yeah, 1.871. The gas. So what's interesting about this? What's two standard deviations? Three point. So what's the minimum expected number of heads? 3.25. Yeah, so if you do two times the standard deviation, so if I say the mean is 7 minus twice the standard deviation, what do you get again? 3.258. 3.258. Sounds about right. And of course, do the same thing. If I take 7 plus twice, 1.871, that'll be the maximum. And what's that? 10.742. 10.742. Okay. So if I flip a coin 14 times, I can get all the way down to like four heads and it would still be okay. It wouldn't freak me out. It's not that far away from seven anyway. We shouldn't get freaked out. Cool. Now, if I went crazy and I just calculated the binomial, I did the binomial probability for zero successes up through 14, I would end up with a table like this. That should remind you of section 2, 2 maybe. 2, 2 is where you made the frequency distributions. So that would be the, like a relative frequency distribution. So I can make a histogram out of it. Now what gets a little weird is this is not continuous data, right? And it's not classes because there's a lot of repeats. So for example, what do you think the class boundaries would be for 9? You still make it the same exact way. You go up and down by a half, right? So the class boundary for nine would be eight and a half up to nine and a half. I love it. Cool. So that's exactly what I've drawn here. I didn't draw. I had the computer do it. You can tell because it looks good, and nice. Um, let's see how these rectangles. They all have a width of one. Because somebody's telling me, what's the area of this rectangle? How tall is it? And how wide is it? One. So the area of this rectangle is equal to the probability of getting 11 heads. You with me? And it's not really just because of the way I drew this. This is actually a general idea. When we draw a probability, just when we draw it, when we draw a histogram or a probability distribution like a normal curve, it's automatically been set up. You should have had it set up before then so that when you add them all up, you should get one. one. So each piece, the, the, the size of the rectangle or the size of the area around the number you're interested in should represent the, the likelihood that that's going to happen. Of course, it's the biggest dude here, right? He's the most likely thing. In this case, it's not one of those weird situations. This is the mean. It is the mode. It's symmetric around seven. Right? If I would have just done this, it would have been fine. Okay, how are we doing so far? So if I wanted to know the probability that it was at most six heads, and for some reason at most freak people out, like at least at most. So at least I always think you have to be at least this tall to ride the ride, right? And at most is you have at most this many people on an elevator. So I don't want to go over it. I want to go under it, right? So like, no, dude, stay out. Maybe I'll step out. I've seen one too many elevator horror movies. <laughs> Little old lady gets on. No, I'm out. Let me get the reference. Um, so at most six heads, what, how, what areas would I add up to get at most six heads? At most six means what? 
Less than it means six and less than six, right? Most six means you get is six, so it'd be zero plus one plus two plus I'd add up these areas to get the probability of at most six. Right? Which really translates into just adding these numbers, of course, right? Because they're all with one, so all the areas are equal to how tall they are, because it's times one to get the area. Keep saying area because I want that to stick in your brain. That area of a probability distribution equals the probability of that situation, whatever that area represents. So the area from zero to six is the same as the probability of zero to six. <coughs> okay, cool. So whatever the hell that would be if you add all those up. How would you do in the calculator, real quick? How would you do it on the calculator real quick? Which one would you use, binomial P or binomial C? C. C. And you would just put in 6 because it's hardwired to go 0 up to the number you put in, right? So it's a binomial CDF, 14, comma, 0. 0.5, comma, 6. And that would be the answer. Right. So who's got that? Is anybody actually doing that? It's probably at most 6 heads. Just add up, up to 6. Do it one more time. 0.395. 0.395? That sounds about right. Nobody's contradicting you, so I'm going to go with it. Cool. Um, so obviously, I kind of made this point over and over again. It's connected to the area that we're interested in. Uh, the area of the whole thing, you told me already, must be 1. For a uniform distribution, so they talk about uniform distributions in the homework. What do you think that word means in this case? Uniform distribution. This is not uniformly distributed because the heights are all different. So for a uniform distribution, the heights would be the same. So if I had a, a uniform distribution, uniform distribution, uh, let's not do some weird stuff. Say from zero up to two. How tall does it have to be to make this correct? Let me see if anybody was paying attention from earlier. How tall? So it's got to be uniform, right? How tall does it have to be to make this work out correctly? What should the whole area be? 1.4. One. 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 Oh, one. The area should be 1. So how tall would it make it so the area is 1? How wide is it? 2. 2. So how tall should it be? 1. If it was one, the area would be two. I want the area to be one. One point five. So we have good. That was painless. <laughs> so if it was zero to four, it would have to go up to point two five. Craziness, right? So if they ask you, what's the probability? It's one point seven. That's a really good place. Zero point seven <laughs> up to one point three. I want to know this probability. What's the probability that it's in there? How would you do it? Let it be nice and easy. I just got to find the area. That's all I got to do. So what's the area of that rectangle I just drew? Two. Can't be two because the area of the whole damn thing is one. How wide is that rectangle? One. Two. 0.6 wide. What is happening? So the rectangle goes from 0.7 to 1.3. So it's got to be 0.6 wide. How tall is it? It's 0.6 times 0.5? 0.3. So the probability of something, if I have a uniform distribution, so everything happens equally likely from 0 to 2. And there's a lot of things in life that are equally likely, believe it or not. So I have equally likely things from 0 to 2. What's probably it's in there? 30% chance it's in there. Because that area is 30% of the whole damn area. So what, what game do you, does anybody play this game where the areas get smaller and there's higher points? You're throwing stuff at it? Darts, yeah, so it kind of makes sense that the small area in the middle is going to be worth more points because the probability you get it in there, if you just throw in randomly, it's very small. Right, so I've watched darts before, professional dart players, I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> don't hit the ball once. <laughs> when I play, you just don't want to be anywhere near. <laughs> right? It also depends on how many drinks you've had, and then you really don't want to be anywhere near. Okay. So you will see some uniform distribution stuff in the book. It should be pretty simple, hopefully. 
So the really important thing I want to talk about today is, is normal distributions. We're kind of going to get in there. So if the probability distribution, and you can have probability distributions that have triangular shapes. You can have probability distributions that have uh, uh, reverse parabolic shapes, whatever. You just got to always make sure. One thing, if you ever go further in probability at all for some reason, you always want to normalize it. So whatever the area is, you divide by that so that it comes out to be one. And then you can make all these probabilities that you want. Um, so if I did have a triangular probability distribution, right, from, I don't know, one to three, and I want to know what probably it's from one to 1.4, I just have to find this area. And actually, the area would be relatively easy. Uh, relatively easy, I say, because you still have to figure out this height, which will be interesting. So, we're, but, but do you see how it's doable? It's just geometry then, right? Now, where it makes the transition, the normal distribution is nothing that I know an area formula for. I know area formulas for triangles. I know area formulas for rectangles, right? But I do not know an area formula for this dude. I know, no, I just don't. Uh, I don't know. Okay. So how many people have had calculus before? All right. So obviously we're not going to do calculus, but, but you guys will understand a little bit better what I'm about to say. But the rest of us we're going to use, uh, we're, we're all going to use a table. I'm not going to make you guys integrate this because it's actually impossible. You have to do it numerically. But let me show you the formula. I don't think I've shown you this yet, have I? Maybe I did. The formula for the normal distribution. I think I did show this to you. Yeah, I'm just going to do it one more time. That's it. This is the formula for that shape. So if you type this into your calculator, your graphing calculator, if you picked a, for, uh, 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 value for mu and a value for sigma and type this into y1 and plot it, it'll actually give you uh, a normal distribution. Let's, let's try it real quick. I've never done this for class before and I suddenly want to. So if you don't want me to, it's too damn bad. So give me a, a mean. 15. Somebody write that down, 15. Give me a standard deviation. Somebody else? 2.0. Oh. 2.5. Somebody give me a standard deviation. No, that's a Holy huge. crap. <laughs> it still will work. What the hell? So 13. Fine. Write that down. 13. All right. So we're going to create this real quick. Let's see how quick it is. So I don't know how many. You all should have seen exponentials, right? You've all gone through 1 of 3, 1, 10. Somehow you've all done e to the something, right? Remember that? Exponentials? Uh oh. Oh shit. Don't unmute this thing. Just say yes, Jeff. I've done that. <laughs> So I want to do that. Negative half. So that's 0.5. Times. I just just sit there and watch. Right. Um, X minus the mean was 15. Mean 15. Over. Oops. I want one more press in there. This is why we don't. I don't make you guys do this. It's a little gross. Divided by the standard deviation was 13? 13. Squared. That's about right. All of that divided by <coughs> the standard deviation, which was 13, times, of course, this only makes sense, square root of 2 pi. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, all caught. Sorry, that's totally not <laughs> obvious. All right, how are we doing? Now, if, if I have a normal window, zoom six, if I have a normal window, I'm not going to see it because the mean, well, I'll see part of it, hopefully. Let's see how long it takes for this to do this. And of course, how tall is this going to be? Considering the whole area is supposed to be one, this thing is not going to be very tall at all. So let me change my window just a little bit. Um, so the standard deviation is 13 and the mean is 15. So I, I, let's say I want to see up to 70. And I want to go down to negative 50. That should probably capture most of it. And I want to make the y max 
Let's make it point three. Let's see what happens. Holy crap. I should change my one in. I should have taken your numbers. Did you put twice in the deviation? So where does this do that? Oh, yeah, look at all the areas. The probabilities are so small. Okay. All right, stop. Stop, stop, stop. So I want to be able to, let's make this, the y max I want to really, so I want to 0.04 basically. Oh yeah, I should, at the same time. Stop. Stop thinking. Okay. <laughs> Let me make my y min. All right, let's see if this gets it. Please. There it is. There you go. Cool. It's that easy. Now, Gordon, with, those, with that, <laughs> so, so was, that standard deviation was so huge that it took the area of one and, and spread it way out. That's why it didn't get very high. It's such a wide thing, it's got to be very short, so it still adds up to an area of one. You guys semi with me? Yeah. Now, again, I, I just wanted to do that and show you. There's the shape. There's the Gaussian curve. It's a normal curve. Cool. And you could actually do calculus in the calculator. We're not going to do that for uh, and I don't know if you've had calculus before, you should see that this is one of those e to the x squares, basically. Mm -hmm. You can't integrate the damn thing, so it's only numerically uh, done. You can only do it numerically. But if you look in the very back of your book, very back of your book, this table in the very back, or in the insert, this table, I call this basically empirical rule on steroids or whatever you want to fill in there. So this would be all the areas for any z-score I want. So I can start at negative 3.5. It's way the hell down there. So the way this table is set up, let me see if I can get this thing to show me this. All right. There we go. That's a little better. All right. The way this table is set up, if I want to know the area below, uh, actually, let's, let's figure this out from empirical rule. What area should be below uh, z square of negative 1? So what, what's between 1 and negative 1? How, how much area would be between uh, 1 and negative 1 to z square? 2. Empirical rule, within one step is how much? 1. 68%. 68%. Not chubby, dude, because this is a normal curve, right? So this is 68%. So how much should be down here? 32 is outside, so how much is down here? 16. 16%, roughly. Those are actually kind of approximate, so it's actually going to be just a little less. So let's look it up. So if I look up negative 1 in that chart, negative 1.00 in the chart, it better tell me something close to 16%, or we can throw the whole damn thing out and go do something else for the rest of the semester. So you're all like, come on, publisher, come on, publisher, make a mistake on that one. Come on, you can do it. So do I have negative one? No, Jeff. Oh, shit, we got to wait. So if you look at negative one, negative 1.00. Oh. Too bad. <laughs> you see that? 0.158 cents, so that would round to 16%. So that this chart is like, before we only knew empirical, we could only do one, two, three, and then like below one and above two or something silly. We couldn't do, if, if the z-score is 1.89, there was not a damn thing we could do about it. But can anyone tell me what area is below a z-score of 1.89? What's this area? So what's the probability of that? Those are the same thing. The area in that chart is equal to the probability of that situation. So it's the probability that somebody would have a test score that was less than 1.89 if it was normally distributed. Can you guys look it up? Who is their book? Anybody have a book anymore nowadays? You can bring a little tablet if you have the e-book. You have the inserts. I, I will bring some copies of the z-chart for you guys to have. Uh, it looks like I might bring more than I was expecting. So if I look at, now obviously these are negative z-scores, so I probably want to look at orange z -score. So 1.89, do you see how this works? 1.8, no Jeff, don't make it sick. 
And then this top row is the second decimal place. So if I want 1.89, I go 1.8 is here, and then 9 is here. Zoom out, Jeff, it'd be easier. So 1.89 is right here. 9706. So 97% chance that if it was normally distributed, it would be below 1.89 z-score. Now, now, I want you to realize the power of what we've just done. Uh, and I know you currently don't. Currently don't have a clue. This is just a big chart with a bunch of freaky numbers. At least you buy into it because I just recovered the empirical rule, right? So that's just the empirical rule. You could do any other empirical rule check you wanted to, and it's got to agree. But now it fills in all the holes in the middle. So going back to uh, men, uh, let's actually do SAT scores. Wow. The mean SAT score, not SAT scores, IQ scores. Very different things. So the mean IQ score is 100, and the standard deviation is 15. And it's known to be normally distributed. This is a little bit of a cop-out because it's actually forced to be normal, but oh well, it is a normal distribution. So I want to know what's the probability somebody has more than 133 IQ, which is the cutoff score, I think, for Mensa. You ever heard of Mensa? Mensa member. Huh? Mensa member. Oh, cool. So Mensa people have above 133 IQs. They don't let you in if you're not. Right? I don't know that they have their own IQ test they believe in. Yes? OK. So how the hell would you do this? Well, what is this chart? The chart is in the back of the book, so obviously the book doesn't want to stay open. What's this chart need for me to look up probabilities, look up areas? What's the chart need first? Do I have what I need? How did we look up the area for the 1.89? Because what was 1.89? A z-score. And the chart is called the z-score chart. So what do I not have yet? I don't have a z-score. right? And why do I know I can use that chart? Beautiful. Be very, you know, this is stupid important. You cannot use that chart if you do not know it's normally distributed. So now you start to see why in a lot of statistics, there's a lot of tests to see if your distribution is normal enough. If it's normal enough, you can use all that. you got all that information. Somebody's already done all the freaking work for you. Kick ass. If it's not normal enough, shit, you either do it again or you use some really weird methods that you don't learn in this class. It would be a stats too if we had it. So how do I turn that into a z-score? First, draw the picture. What goes right in the middle? 100, definitely, right? For normal distribution, the mean is the mode, is the median. So that's right in the middle, 100. Then I put down the 133. Now, for some reason, I have people that put it over there. <laughs> it is a true scale, right? It's got to make sense. The 133 has got to be over here somewhere. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just want to kind of give yourself an anchor. And yeah, I know, threes are not my thing. All right? For a math teacher, there's certain numbers I can't make, but oh, well, too bad for you. And then shade in the area that you want. You want the area that's above that. Let me stop right there. You guys see how to create the trust me. The people that don't draw this picture are the people that will make the most mistakes. I can't say that enough. And there's always somebody who's like, whatever, man. Yeah, there, there you go. You're just trying to prove it to yourself? Trust me. In my old uh, stats teacher, he would make us draw two of these for every problem. He'd make us draw one for the what's called the raw scores which are the IQ scores or the shoe sizes or the goat ages or the whatever, right? The raw score from the real world. And then another picture for the Z score. But would those look different? No, they're going to look exactly the same. So what I always do is, as I've been talking, has anybody discovered what the Z score is yet? What's the formula for the Z score? You guys remember? It's been a little while. That's right, you're all bookless. So you're like, I don't remember and I have no book. Uh, Remember that? It was all about how far away from the mean it was. 
in standard deviations, right? So don't forget, I'm always going to ask you that question on the test. And someday I'll get fewer than 10 people get it wrong. Um, so what will the z-score be for this? How do I set this formula up? What's x? Good, the score I'm interested in, 133. Minus the mean, 100, divided by standard deviation, 15. So what do you get? 2.2. Good. 2.20? Gotcha, gotcha. So now you see why z-scores, you take it out to two places because the chart goes out to two places. Cool. So if I look up 2.2, what's not quite right about that? What does the chart always tell me? The area that's where? Behind it. Yeah, underneath it. <laughs> well, we can, that's fine. We can, we can work with that. Because the whole damn thing adds up to be yeah. 1. So if I know that much, to get the rest of it, I just do 1 minus that. So what do I get when I get 2.2? If you realize the shortcut, I'm going to get to it. I'll tell you the shortcut in a minute. But when I look up 2.20, looks like I get 0.9861. Do you guys see that? Yeah. Should have brought the. Should have made some copies. I didn't realize so many people were bookless. Thank you. So 0 0.9861. So the minute you look up a z-score in the chart, you put it in the right place on the picture. So then you're, it's telling you, dude, you haven't found the answer yet. Because the answer is where you shaded it, right? So of course, how do I find the answer? One minus, One minus that. Which is, yeah, you know, oh, one, three, nine. I want to use that thing I showed you earlier, or you can use this thing. So a shortcut. I don't know. There's a shortcut inherent in this. The area, and, and I forgot about this. This is one of the most important parts. Underneath this, put your z-scores because when you start having multiple scores, you want to put the z-score with which score it's with. That was. Really interesting grammar in that sentence, but you guys went with it, so it's all right. So the area that's above 2.2, thank you. How would it be related to the area that's below negative 2.2? Be the same because this picture is it's it's the picture is symmetric. symmetric. Good. So there's a shortcut. If I want to know above 2.2, I could just look up negative 2.2. Now, if you don't fully understand the shortcut, never use it, because I have people that do that, and then they do one minus on top of that, and they end up with the wrong side again. Shaisa. So if you don't totally understand, it's not a big thing. It's not a big thing. Or, or shit, yes. Um, so if you look at negative 2.2, you'll get the same answer we just got a second ago. Hopefully. I got you working overtime. Yeah, there it is. See? 0139. And that's the answer we just got, right? So it's, it's not crazy good. It doesn't help you out a ton, but it's a quick. It's a little bit quicker. All right. So here, I'm going to give you guys several problems to try. I'm going to go wander around the room. Okay. If we're doing really decently with this, I've gone to actually a little further than I wanted to. That's pretty good. Uh, and I want to say this: Section six two. I think they still do this. this if they do. She's so stupid. Is that professional? Yeah, oh my god, okay. Somebody, somebody, uh, help me out. If I change to Z scores, if I change to Z scores, what's the mean now? Zero. And what's the standard deviation? One. Right? One step up, whatever IQ score that is, it's going to be one for a Z score, right? So that's so if I have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, I effectively have Z scores, right? Because then I would subtract zero and divide by one, so my X score would be my Z score. So six two is basically Z scores, but they're really evil about it. They give you a situation. I love this. A bone density test, but then notice the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So these scores down here are effectively Z scores. So 6.2 is all about getting used to the chart, period. It's not this work yet. 
6-2 is just look those numbers up in the chart and make sure that if it says greater than, you subtract from 1 so you get the right side. Stop right there. How you guys doing? You guys kind of with me? So all of 6-2 is nothing but z-scores, even though I don't know why they do that weird shit. Just say it's z-scores and let people do the work. Don't freak people out with that <laughs> stuff. Um, and then section 6-3 would be problems like that. It's just one step from this, right? I make my z-score with a simple little formula, and then I look them up. Okay, so I'm just going to give you z-scores right now, just so I can make sure, and of course, not enough of you have the book, so. All right, well, how am I going to do this? Maybe I'll... Rawr. So I want you to find the area, so if you have the book and you're near somebody with the book and they're a nice person or or you can see their book, um, you can do that. Or look up here. So find these areas for me, please. First, draw the picture, and then you look it up. Third one is a little different. Let's see if you guys can figure it out. <laughs> Less than. Yeah. So this really just says what's probably the Z is in between these two. Thank you. 
Uh, it fills in for you. That's nice. It's upgraded. What's it say? Less names. Just below. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, exactly. She knows about as much as I do. Yeah, so it can't be that, right? doesn't make any sense. All that area is just that little dude. Of course, when you look it up in the chart, it tells you below, and that problem wants above. Yes. So how are we doing here? Less than negative 2.53. So negative 2.53. 0057. Is that what you guys got? Yep. What do you mean? It's the percent. It's the probability. It's several things. That's the area that's below... 2.53 in that picture. Okay. That's the probability that something would have a z-score less than that in a normal distribution, okay. right? And it's the percentage of z-scores that would be below 2.53, negative 2.53. Okay. It's all those things all at once. Yeah. So we really don't have to do anything but look at the chart. It's insane. <laughs> okay. Of course, things are going to get a little more complicated, but they're always built on what we're doing right now. It's kind of, so that's why it's so important. If you know you have a normal distribution, it's going to be relatively easy. Yes. So this, if you drew the picture, zero is always in the middle for z-scores. So negative 2, 5, 3. So the area below it turns out to be, what did I just say? Thank you so much. So this guy, if I look up negative 3.15, what area do you get? Because I want above negative 3.15. So if you look at negative 3.15, you get... And then 1 minus that, 9992, right? Now who looked up positive 3.15? Cool. If you do that, that's the shortcut, and you get that directly. You saved about three seconds. But that adds up over time. So who got number three done? So I'll let you guys take another minute or so. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is that all we have to do for work? How do you mean? Yeah, for section 6-2, definitely. 6-3, you got to show me the z-score work converted to a z-score. Draw the picture. Just like the IQ problem we did earlier, I can't look up 133 on the chart for two reasons. It only have 133, but also it only works with z-scores. So 133 is an IQ score, not a z-score. So section 6.3 is going to give you the average shoe size of people living on Zimonia and the standard deviation, and it's going to say how many, what percentage of people have between this and this, shoe size. So then you're going to make z-scores out of them, look them up in the chart, done. So 6.2 is easy because it, all it really needs you to do is look at the chart. So it's just really just trying to get you used to that chart. So the first thing to do here, of course, is to draw the situation. So here's negative 3.41. All these are negative just because, you know, so I'm a little limited here. But negative 2.54. So I want the area between those two. Now, if you look up negative 2.54, how much do you get the right area? If you look at negative 2.54, do you get the correct area? No. You get more or less area than you want more. Why? Because it goes all the way down. It actually goes all the way down forever. Infinitely long, right? So the normal distribution assumes you go to infinity in both directions. So we kind of adjust that a little bit for the fact that we can't have 80,000 foot tall people, right? They, there's some extreme top part. It goes forever. So it, this is too much. How much too much? I just want this much. I, it's exactly this much too much. So if I look up that area and that area and then <laughs> subtract the areas down. Now, you never subtract z-scores. A z-score tells you what? How many standard deviations away from me? Beautiful. How many standard deviations away from me? So if I subtract the z-scores, I suddenly end up somewhere else than what the problem wants from me, right? You never subtract z-scores. It doesn't make any damn sense. 
But this guy's area minus this area leaves me with the area that I want. So you first, when you look at negative 254, what area do you get? 0.055. 0055, cool. So that's 0055. What about 341, negative 341? 0.003. So then this area would be 0055 minus 0003, so point oh oh. Five, two. Again, and that means that there is a half a percent chance, roughly, 0.5%, that somebody would be in here. If this was heights, there's a half a percent chance that somebody would be that short in between those two. And that's pretty decently far down, right? That would be, how do I know that's definitely unusual territory? Yeah, it's more than two standard deviations away from the meat. So that would be somebody that if you saw them, you would do a double take because you don't see them that often. You don't see somebody that height that often. Because you're rude, because you're human. And we react. We go, oh, I don't see that every day. Okay. You ever watch Carl Pil Pilkington and uh, what's his name? I forgot his name. We'll do the play the Ewok. No. It's <laughs> too bad. Willow. There. Um, so next time I'll bring, yeah, we will get out early. Next time I'll bring a handout that we'll work on that's got a lot of types of problems you'll see in 6.2 and 6.3. And I'll bring a handout for the Z-score chart for everybody. Because even your insert, you cannot use that for the test because it has way too much other information on it that I can't let you access. Formulas with words on it. So it's no good. All right? Words with friends, okay. Words with formulas, no. <laughs> doesn't get better than that, I'm sorry. That's why I teach and I don't do stand-up comedy. All right, guys. Thank you.